Fox News alert. Will the United States stay in or get out? President Trump to announce whether or not the U.S. sticks to the Paris Climate Accord in a Rose Garden ceremony that's set for 3 p.m. Eastern. What his decision will mean for America and the world. This is Outnumbered. I'm Megan McCain. Here today, Harris Faulkner, the anchor of the Intelligence Report with Trish Regan on Fox Business. Trish Regan, Republican strategist and former spokesperson for President George W. Bush, Mercedes Schlapp, and today's hashtag one lucky guy, Iraq and Afghanistan veteran and Fox News contributor Pete Hegseth. Pete, you're outnumbered. Great to be so here. So good to have you back. It's June 1st. Yes, it yes. is June 1st. It's Friday Eve, baby. <laughs> hey, that's even better. Let's yes, it is. It. All right, let's get started. So will America stay or will we go? With all eyes on the White House, sources telling Fox News that President Trump is in fact expected to pull out of the Paris Climate Accord Pact. Doing so would fulfill a campaign promise and be seen as a win for the economy and jobs by his supporters, as well as a blow to President Obama's legacy. Here's former senior communications director for the Trump campaign, Jason Miller. I think we're all on the same side here that we want to make sure that we have clean water and clean air, but we can't go and absolutely gut our economy um, and especially go and fight with both hands tied behind our backs while other countries go and cheat on this. But one of the Senate's biggest voices on the dangers of climate change, Democrat Ed Markey, says pulling out of the Paris Agreement would have disastrous consequences and signal America's, quote, retreat as a world leader. If President Trump announces that he is going to unilaterally pull the United States out of the climate accord that the rest of the world has signed on to, with the exception of Syria and Nicaragua, uh, then it will be a economic, a national security, a public health, and a moral failure for the United States of America. Meantime, anti-tax activist Grover Norquist believes President Trump is in a no-win situation, telling the New York Times, quote, everybody who hates Trump wants him to stay in Paris. Everybody who respects him, trusts him, voted for him, wishes for him to succeed, wants him to pull out. Okay, that's a lot, Pete. Mm -hmm. um, Looks looking like he's probably going to pull out of the Paris Agreement. What do you make of all of this? And to me, that's a win-win. It's delivering on a campaign promise he's had. This climate accord is a bad deal for America. And if you look at this through the lens of America first, you don't want a redistribution of wealth, international redistribution of wealth away from America to other countries, and frankly, a transfer of sovereignty. Sovereignty, even though it's voluntary, you're effectively giving decisions to international bureaucrats and technocrats and taking them away from lawmakers here. So I, I, this is a president who sees the Islamist threat as a key threat, whereas the left and the Democrats today see climate change as their religion. The climate, they're climatists. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why they panic about this. They refuse to see Islam, Islamists as the problem, and instead they want to fight the weather. And so he's saying, nope, this is a bad deal for America. We're going to have clean water. We're going to climb, cl have clean air, kind of like Teddy Roosevelt. We're conservationists, but we don't need to bow at the altar of climate change. Mercedes, do you agree with Grover Norquist that this is a no-win situation for our president? No, I think it's a, a win-win situation for the president. I think that it's very clear that President Obama went too far from a constitutional standpoint. This is a treaty. This is binding the United States and future presidents to this. They did not go through the ratification process. Guess what? 128 countries did go through the ratification mm. process. So what do you, what's the message that you're sending here? We have to go through Congress. It has to get ratified. It never happened. Just like the Iran deal. Exactly. Yeah. So then what are, we, what are we dealing with here? You're setting up a situation where, for example, the Sierra Club or several other environmental groups could legally uh, challenge the president uh, if he were to stay in the Paris Treaty and would not, uh, the Paris Agreement, and would not uh, get out. I mean, that presents uh, problems. And at the end, guess what? This is all about money. The United States and Europe, they're putting, well, they would have to put in billions of dollars to help other countries uh, reach their goals. That's right. So I think for the American taxpayer, it is actually a win situation. You know, Trish, the politics of this can't go unnoticed. It was reported that Ivanka and Jared Kushner were big proponents of him staying in the deal. Steve Bannon, Scott Pruitt, ardently wanted him to pull out. Does this signify anything to you about who he's listening to in the White House? Well, I think that all of the troubles that have surfaced, uh, whether any of them are founded or not, uh, with Jared Kushner has put him in a more vulnerable position, for sure. That said, there's a political component to this. I mean, he made a promise on the campaign trail. And the base, think about the base, they want him to feel fulfill those promises. Uh, the climate accord, in it to, to your point earlier, I mean, we're in an environment now where the left has said the most important issue for the entire world mm. is 
climate change, yet we're dealing with terrorism. And so I think if he goes out and says, okay, I'm not going to be part of this anymore, what it's doing is it's sending a message to his base. It's a political message, and it's saying, I care more about jobs than this climate thing. Yeah. So I'm curious and would want to ask the president, does it have to be mutually exclusive? And something happened over the weekend, I don't know if it was a trial balloon or what it was, but there was some suggestion and talk that maybe the president look at staying in so he could change the agreement from within. It would be apparent that that's not going to happen this afternoon at 3 p.m. Eastern and you want to be watching Fox News for this. Uh, but. What is the alternative? He does have to then come forth with some sort of an idea of what we will be doing. So what will the policy look like? Will there be zero? Is he meeting with corporation heads to make sure that whatever can be done uh, at that private sector level will be? I tend to think I see this president doing that, and I, I just wish people would take a beat and see what his plan is at 3 p.m. Eastern today, because there will be more commentary than just we're pulling out. There has to be a timetable for that. It has to look like something. He is delaying so that he can get this right. He's been criticized for not necessarily rolling some things out right. Let's watch and see how he does this. I time. think that's a great point. He's 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 willing to be sensitive, sensible to business interests. This is Absolutely. a businessman that understands how regulations like this and impact. advantageous, not just sensible. Advantageous to businesses. Right. There's a way you can be responsible with the climate without crushing regulations to businesses. And he probably understands that he does understand that American legislators do it better than someone in yeah. Brussels is going well, to do it. Well, and the left is never going to do it because they're in bed with the enviros and they turned their backs on the unions and the workers a long time ago. There's something that happened in America. It's called the fracking boom. And that fracking boom is the it's called the emissions to come down in America. Guess what? China, because they're part of the Paris Agreement, and you see Merkel hanging out with the Chinese president, they don't have to. They can increase emissions until 2030. Right. They don't even That's have to abide time. by the same yeah. rules that the United time. States is abiding by. The thinking, right, from China's perspective, or India, which is also guilty of the same thing, and their perspective is well, $5 billion. Trips. We haven't had the benefit that you guys all have had. You've been able to have all these carbon emissions over the last several decades. we got to get our shot at it too. Yeah. Well, if you're Donald Trump, why not approach us and say, look, let's do better than that. We maybe or maybe don't, depending on where your science is, know that this could be a problem. So why don't we all agree to cut? And hey, China, hey, India, hey, Russia, yeah. you're going to have to cut too. You know how popular that idea would be? About as popular as he was standing at the NATO headquarters telling them that 23 out of 28 members need to step up and pay their fair share. I don't think it's a coincidence that we're on the heels of that trip now having a conversation about others paying their fair share. There's a theme here. This president is setting the tone and the narrative. Let's see what he says in place of the Paris Accord uh, and, and see yeah. where we go with this. It, we, won't, it won't be popular in Paris or in Brussels, but it will right. be popular in Pennsylvania, Ohio, yeah, and that's and Virginia, what counts. And North yeah. Carolina. Yeah. All right. He's just keeping a campaign promise. Even before the president announces his decision, mayors in several of the most liberal cities are already saying they'll uphold the Paris Agreement if Mr. Trump decides to abandon it. Those cities include New York City, Chicago, Atlanta, Boston, and Los Angeles. New York City Mayor de Blasio says he'll sign an executive order if he has to. Both he and Boston Mayor Marty Walsh are speaking out. This is... Uh, a dagger aimed straight at the heart of New York City. Donald Trump is from New York City. He should know better. He makes no sense. It's dangerous. And we in New York City are going to have to take matters into our own hands. And by the way, that's what cities all over the country and all over the world are going to do. That's what states and provinces are doing. It shouldn't be this way, but it's what's necessary. No matter what the president decides, I want to make it absolutely clear that the White House and our partners worldwide that the city of Boston will not back down. I call on, city, on cities nationwide to do the same. So this reminds me of the sanctuary cities, obviously. To, to, you know, Mayor de Blasio and Mayor Garcetti are also taking matters into their own hands, not abiding by federal law. Probably know what you think of this, but let me know. Well, actually, a little bit different. And it's different in, in that in sanctuary cities, you're refusing to enforce the law. Mm -hmm. In these cities, they're going to say, we're going to go above and beyond. I say, go ahead. If you want to increase regulations within your own uh, municipality and make business more difficult or, or be f more focused on green energy, fine. If you think that's economically viable for you, you do your thing. Citizens get to choose whether they want to pay more taxes to have mm -hmm. more focus on green energy and less carbon emissions. Do businesses want those regulations that make them less competitive in other cities that are not bowing at the altar of climate change? So do what you want, Mayor de Blasio. You're only going to hurt businesses in your own uh, 
municipality. So Harris, you and I have talked about, I used to live in Los Angeles. I used mm -hmm. to work for a company that was completely altogether environmentalist. And I remember having conversations and they, asked, they were asking me, why do people in the middle of the country don't respond to us mm -hmm. in the same way mm -hmm. that I do? And part of it is there's, I always use Leonardo DiCaprio as the classic mm -hmm. example, hanging around on plane. yachts, going on his private jets, having yeah. a much larger carbon footprint than any average American, saying to average Americans, you need to give up your jobs, you need to make all these changes in your life, which, by the way, are going to be a lot more expensive, and I'm not going to do anything but the onus is on you. And I think this debate, we can all be conservationists. We can all want to have clean water in the Grand Canyon. But when you get to a point where you're in this dystopian existential crisis, telling average Americans this is more important than your jobs and ISIS, no wonder you've lost the majority of support. Well, it's politicized, and I think Americans, at least, and I don't have to think it, I know it's true, they're so divided that they're looking for issues where they can come together that potentially affect their lives immediately. That's why they want the domestic issues like Obamacare replacement, repair, whatever it is they're going to do to it to come forth before anything like this because they feel the immediate effects of it yeah. and they want to take that politics arm out of it if they can. I don't know that you can necessarily do that with anything much, but this feels otherly to many people. This is not an immediate thing for them. Now, if this releases uh, some regulations, if this empowers corporations to create more jobs because they don't have to meet all of these kind of arbitrarily set uh, gates for us to hop through, then they'll feel it immediately and they would probably have, have a voice and yeah, we like this. If you're a taxpayer in New York City, which I am at the moment, and you have Mayor Bill de Blasio saying it doesn't matter, we're going to go in our own regulations, how do you think most New Yorkers are going to respond to this? You know, I, I think that Pete makes a very good point. You're going to respond depending on how the economy is. And de Blasio is going to be out of a job if the economy is not doing well. And if businesses say, look, we don't want to be in this area or any particular city that is putting these kind of regulations on us, but we can go somewhere else across to another state, to sure. another city, where we're not going to have these. I mean, you look at, for example, I like GE, this example in Connecticut, right? GE had been there for a number of years. General Electric, huge company, employed a ton of people. Well, they raised taxes in Connecticut, so GE said, see you later, and they're moving to Massachusetts. It's the same thing here. You can't overregulate. Mm -hmm. That's right. All right, let's break in with some breaking news now. Uh, this is just coming together, actually, as I was speaking. <laughs> so, let's get she to can multitask. It. FBI Director James Comey now. We have a firm date on when he will testify, and here's what we're being told. He will be testifying both in open and closed-door session with the Senate Intelligence Committee. That is next Thursday, 10 a.m. East Coast time. Uh, and we want to talk about this for just a second. Let me set it up this way. And remind everybody of what the stakes are at this point. This is a man, Pete, mm -hmm. who said that our president, in no uncertain terms, wanted him to back off an active investigation. That's right. Of General Michael Flynn the at the time. Yeah. Right. And potential Russian connections and the problems we know, because we've been reporting them here on Fox News, that, that Michael Flynn has had. Mm -hmm. uh, so he wanted him to back off. However, if he did, in fact think that that had happened, it would be a crime if he didn't report it to people who would know that the president might have interfered in an active investigation. Comey never did that. He never reported it. So is he in the wrong? We've been waiting to see the memos that he says exist. Right. They're very redacted. I don't know that they would help much anyway. So that's what's at stake here. That's what we're watching and listening for next Thursday, 10 a.m. Eastern, pop your corn. That's, pop your corn, <laughs> indeed. That's where, and he's apparently already talked to uh, Bob Mueller about, you know, who's conducting the investigation himself about what he will or will not FBI say. Director Former Mueller. FBI director. I mean, it, the, the question really is, what was the intent of what was said inside the Oval Office? A lot of people are going to push on that. If you really felt pressured at that moment, wouldn't he have made mention of it. Instead, it felt like he, he noted it as a get-out-of-jail free card. Like, hey, I'm going to stuff this down later in case something else happens. But it was likely in the moment that President Trump said, come on, man, there's nothing here. Just easy. Fish? Yeah, I... I think that the danger here, perhaps, for Donald Trump is that James Comey may be a little ticked off. He yeah. might not have liked yeah. how that all went down, getting fired and learning Sat about it, yeah. and learning it at lunch <laughs> on TV. It was. So you wonder how much of that, and look, we're all human beings, how much of that does that, does that play into whatever testimony you see? But I think you've got to go back to this. I, I think we've probably seen the worst of the memo. I think they leaked the worst of the memo. I mean, if there's more there, yeah. uh, perhaps that will come out. But we may have seen was the worst of Was there a smoking gun in what you saw? There was not. I mean, I think 
it, it will get to tone and what did he mean? But it was and that's something that's very subjective. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Ju subjective. I mean, how how do you know exactly if he's saying, hey, he's a nice guy, you know, maybe well, let this one go. Remember, J. Edgar Hoover, a f former FBI director back in the day, he would keep political profiles of individuals and he would use it against uh, politicians. And mm -hmm. so it really comes mm -hmm. to question, was there a political motivation based on what FBI, former FBI director Comey was doing? And why didn't he report it yeah. to the FBI, you know, the in intelligence community and basically saying, I'm very concerned of where the president Contemporaneously. is Contemporaneously. Exactly. He needed to do it immediately, and that did not happen. So there's, I think, a lot more questions. In why did it take so long to produce the memos? Boy, we, we will go on about this because there's more to talk about. So that uh, testifying, James Comey, Thursday, June 8th. 10 a.m. Eastern, and we'll talk more about this later this hour. For now, new fallout over allegations the Obama administration illegally spied on the Trump campaign. Three former Obama administration officials being named in subpoenas set to in sent to intelligence agencies in an effort to get to the bottom of the unmasking of names. So, what can we expect? Will anybody be held accountable? We ask that about our government a lot. <laughs> Accountability. Uh, Hillary Clinton, back on the attack. Is anybody listening? Is this thing on? <laughs> Blaming virtually everybody but herself for her 2016 election loss, whatever happened to taking responsibility. So it's a theme, accountability, responsibility, we'll talk about it all. <laughs> and after the show, we're going to pop up online, foxnews.com slash outnumbered. Click on the overtime tab, or you can watch us live on Facebook. We appreciate that. Tell us where you're watching from, too. Our handle is outnumbered FNC. And tweet, tweet, little birdie, we're already on our phones. We're coming right back. House Intelligence Committee Chairman Devin Nunes has issued subpoenas to the FBI, the CIA, and the NSA. And he's stepping up the investigation into which former Obama administration officials requested the unmasking of President Trump's campaign officials in classified reports, which later, as you know, got leaked to the press. That's how we knew the names. The subpoenas specifically name former National Security Advisor Susan Rice, former CIA Director John Brennan, and former UN Ambassador Susan Power. But none is formally accused of any wrongdoing. President Trump tweeted this morning, quote, the big story is the unmasking and surveillance of people that took place during the Obama administration. Meanwhile, former CIA Director James Woolsey says, while it's too soon to tell where this is going, it would be a major concern of classified information was handled as it's being alleged. Watch. But then if you go further and you unmask and you show it to, that to people who uh, don't have clearances or don't have a need to know, um, you've, for whatever reason, political or whatever, um, you've done a very bad and dangerous thing from the point of view of classified information. But in as a dip Why is it dangerous, Pete? Why is it dangerous? Because you're, you're putting sources and methods at risk. You're, you're taking classified information and giving it to reporters and broadcast it to the world. And you're creating pipelines that mean more of that can happen. I think the president's absolutely right here. Reading the tea leaves on this, talking to people inside and outside, it feels like the unmasking and the sharing and the leaking of intelligence is the real scandal here, not at all any sort of collusion between Russia and President Trump. You have effectively have two investigations going on, on through the House Intel Committee. Democrats trying to find that Russian connection that doesn't exist, and Republicans saying we want to talk to these former Obama administration officials, especially Samantha Power. That's the interesting one. She's not an yeah. intelligence operative. She's the U.N. ambassador. What's she doing so unmasking why did names? She, why did she need that That could be a big key, and I think there really could be some there there. I absolutely agree with Pete. I think the big question here is Samantha Powers, U.N. ambassador, handling this information where they're unmasking American citizens, dealing specifically with the Trump campaign. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a lot of questions surrounding this. We know that the only reason is that you ask for this information about masking is a legitimate reason that an intelligence analyst would ask for this with the right clearance. She is not an intelligence analyst, and there is no reason why she should be viewing this information. So I see a couple of different things going on here, Trish. For one, uh, you had such a wide list of people who had access to this and then it broadens out and you get to those reporters and and we know as reporters when you handle leaked classified information that's why we are taught ethically what to do it's we make decisions all the time about not releasing rape victims names we know what's classified and what to do with that material but now it's it's kind of as you said almost in the vernacular almost in 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 the bloodstream of doing this yeah and I think that so many reporters right now uh, aren't really reporters but sort yes. of people with agendas and they don't like Donald Trump they absolutely don't and they still wish Hillary Clinton had won and so they can't quite get over that so if they hear of anything that's classified and leaked coming out, their decision perhaps is 
one in which they will move too quickly to release that they information. That they're not they're not taking the pause. They're not triple checking necessarily. They just want to get it out there. And I, for one, I, I'm sure you all do as well. I find this very frustrating as a journalist because you feel like you're dealing in all this innuendo and, you know, this leak source said this or this. And it's like, well, what is actually there on all sides of this? But it's not just journalists. I mean, we're at a place now where MI5 is not going to share their intelligence about their recent terror attack because they don't trust that we're not going to leak everything, every piece of information everywhere. Those are real life ramifications about security yes. risks that we're seeing play out in real life and making Americans less safe. Going forth with the unmasking, keep in mind, this is the same administration that targeted Tea Party members by the IRS specifically for simply being Tea Party members. This is not above them. This isn't something that I wouldn't put past them. And for whatever reason, this specific story, which I still think this is the Watergate of our time, if this ends up being true, it's incredible to me the lack of attention it's getting. Yeah. It it is. I want to ask you about that. What do you think about that? No, it's not the bullseye that, that it should be in terms of the focus of it. No, it's because the chattering left wing classes, uh, are, it's not about patriotism anymore. It's not about love of country, a civic duty of what you do with this intelligence. It's get it out there as quickly as possible because they've been baptized in social justice as global <laughs> citizens, truly, in it's academia as they true. go through. They don't have the same allegiance to God and country, and so they're happy to get the story, get the scoop, get the click, and especially because it's President Trump. Then they can undermine him using anonymous sources. Why do we trust the Washington Post and the New York Times? Why? They used to be credible sources, maybe. Now they're full of leftists who are trying to bring down President Trump. Wow. Mercedes, last thought? No, just I think it's what we've got to keep in mind here is that the Democrats are ensuring that this masking narrative, unmasking narrative, does not continue. Yeah. They want to focus primarily on the Russian probe. For them, this idea of unmasking, they don't even want to ask the questions. But we have to, we need to figure out, we have to unravel what's happening uh, with these Obama administration officials. All right. Moving on. Time for Hillary Clinton to finally look in the mirror. And what will she see? How she what blames she virtually see? everybody and anything but herself and her own campaign for why she lost in November. We're still talking about this because she's still talking about this. This is her list of grievances for why she came out the loser is growing and growing. <laughs> and grow oh, look, we're scrolling it. <laughs> oh, my God. I'm going to give you a warning. Jesus, take the wheel in this next segment. Who doesn't she blame? Hillary, Hillary Clinton coming out swinging as she lists the excuses, and there are many, for why she lost the presidential election. For starters, the losing candidate suggests Trump voters are racist, and then that the president colluded with the Russians. Watch. He really understands how to inflame people. Whatever resentment or point of anger that you may have, if he can get into it, whether it's race or sex or xenophobia or anti-Islamophobia, the Russians, in my opinion, and based on the intel and counter-intel people I've talked to, could not have known how best to weaponize that information unless they had been guided. And here's a... Here's guided what, by Americans. Guided by Americans. But you're I, leaning Trump. Yes. Okay. Yes, okay. I'm leaning Trump. I think... I think it's pretty hard not to. Doesn't stop there. Hillary Clinton also taking shots at her own party, sexism, and the media for why she lost. All part of a laundry list of grievances. Mm. I inherit nothing from the Democratic Party. What do you mean nothing? I mean it was bankrupt. It was on the verge of insolvency. Its data was mediocre to poor, non-existent, wrong. I had to inject money into it. This is the DNC. The, the DNC to keep it going. At some point, it sort of bleeds over into misogyny. Mm -hmm. And let's just be honest. You know, people who have a, a set of expectations about who should be president and what a president looks like, um, you know, they're going to be much more skeptical and critical. The use of uh, my email account was uh, turned into, you know, the biggest scandal since Lord knows when. This was the biggest nothing burger ever. They covered it like it was Pearl Harbor. 
All right. Uh -huh. In fact, she blamed 24 separate things during that interview. This is my own personal version of hell. Just watching that loop <laughs> over and over again. Let's did she join? Them. Did she join the voice? Why is she sitting that weird red chair? I feel the FBI. Like put that to music. So my personal favorite is blaming the DNC, saying I came yeah. in with nothing, and blaming her staffers. Friend. That was my personal favorite. Wait, though, the Pete. D didn't the DNC rig the system so that Bernie would get beat? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'll, yeah. You know what I mean? I mean, this is the same system she very much benefited from. She she has not and will not leave the denial phase of this process. Uh, and unfortunately, some people never do. And for the Democratic Party, which is the last list, name listed there, they're going to be the ones holding the bag for this. Because if you don't have a postmortem as to why you lost, or you didn't campaign in Wisconsin or in Michigan, and it turns out that deplorables comment, which you made, you actually uh, believe. Because she made it again right there as a reason why. She called Trump supporters, the President Trump, the underbelly. He can tap into the underbelly, the sentiments. Of, that is the most backhanded compliment you can find. He under, President Trump understood what the American people feel, which is that we'd fallen behind under Barack Obama and we could be great again. She just can't understand. Can we get back to James Comey for just a second? Because now we know he's going to testify next Thursday at 10 a.m. Eastern. I remember when he last testified publicly that no one had ever strong-armed him. And I'm not specifically quoting him. I think his words were more like forced him to or suggested that he not go forth with any investigation. So mm -hmm. I, I'm curious about him and kind of his truthfulness and, and moving forward with regard to this now with Hillary Clinton. And I know we've got a little bit for how he didn't, you know, she said she was not careless in her email practices. Back in July, Comey said this. Although we did not find clear evidence that Secretary Clinton or her colleagues intended to violate laws governing the handling of classified information, there is evidence that they were extremely careless in their handling of very sensitive, highly classified information. So Sounds with the like current president, burger. he's saying one thing about Why do I have how I was to never asked to stop this? any investigation, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And at the same time, he's saying this about Hillary Clinton. Your thought? Uh, uh, I was talking with Mercedes in the commercial break because I was a lot more uncensored when I was getting my hair <laughs> and makeup done, quite frankly. And I, you say a lot of people don't get over it. Actually, I've been around politicians who lose and have lost big. Normally, they do. Sure. This is unusual. I'm telling you, to go on TV, to be this angry, to be blaming everyone else but yourself, she's clearly not dealing with it emotionally in the way that I think is healthy. I'm certainly not a doctor, but why her family is letting she's her go on TV. Worse. And just, it is getting worse, and it seems to be getting more erratic and more sort of mentally unhinged from reality. Well, first of all, I think Hillary Clinton, she needs like a closed door therapy session. I think this idea of going out in public and constantly trying to rationalize how, why she lost or how she lost is, is detrimental. Also, I think for the Democrats, they want to turn the page. They want to move on to the next chapter. Their chapter right now is titled Resistance. But for the most part, they don't want Hillary Clinton just rehashing the election over and over again. No, I don't think she'll run again. But now we're talking that Joe Biden yeah. is well, by the way, way, just oh, has probably should have run from exactly. the get-go. The problem Hillary Clinton had and will always have is that she is not likable. She's not a good politician. She doesn't seem to really like people the way you kind of need if you want to be successful in this business. I mean, you know that, Megan. You have to genuinely want to be out there on the trail talking to people. She didn't. And that is precisely why well, she lost. And her message was off. Friends. I mean, her message yeah, exactly. was off. I mean, wow, throwing shade at the DNC. Everybody loves when you Do we have time for the, the Twitter battle that went on back and forth between President Trump and, and Hillary Clinton? Uh, President Trump tweeted out, crooked Hillary Clinton now blames everybody but herself, refuses to say that she was a terrible candidate, hits Facebook and even dims in DNC. So he takes her on on that. Hmm. And then Hillary tweeted this, people in confefe houses shouldn't throw confefe. <clears throat> so she's following him. Confefe is that she's kind a, of she's type of word that was in him. President she's, Trump's Twitter. She's video. probably watching cable news all night long, obsessing over every small detail. I'm telling you, as someone who was part sure, of an election right. where it lost, this is not the way to do it. You have to focus on the greater good. You have to focus on what's good for America and your party, by the way, at large. And let's remember, Hillary Clinton spent six times more than Donald Trump, and she still wasn't able to win. She didn't go to those battleground states. She was off her economic message. And that's where President Trump was very successful. So I think for Hillary Clinton, it's time to get off the stage, 
turn off the lights and, and just move on to a charitable organization. Do something else. Just get Maybe out of the Clinton Foundation. Time. Maybe yeah. she needs to go find no, not Clinton it's, Foundation. It's not going to happen, though. When you have Chelsea also going on TV on The View yeah. talking about Clinton 2020, their inability to move on for the good of the country yeah. is yeah. unlike yeah. anything I've ever seen in my entire for life. The good of their and own it's, party. This is bad for their party, and it's bad for America. All right, we have just learned that former FBI Director James Comey will testify publicly in the Senate next Thursday morning about his conversations with President Trump. But Mr. Trump could use his executive privilege to block him, whether he should and what the consequence could be. Fox News alert. Okay, so this has been breaking during this hour, and we're going to talk more about it. We're learning former FBI Director James Comey will testify publicly, and it'll happen next Thursday, June 8th. He'll go before the Senate Intelligence Committee, where he'll likely be asked about several interactions with President Trump, including one in which he claims the president encouraged him to stop investigating former National Security Advisor Michael Flynn. Comey has already spoken privately with special counsel Robert Mueller to ensure his testimony does not jeopardize Mueller's investigation. But the New York Times is pointing out the president could block his former FBI chief from testifying by invoking executive privilege. What happens if he does that, Mercedes? Well, then Comey could not testify. I mean, that would be basically it. So I don't foresee President Trump moving forward on the executive, on using executive privilege. So there's no political gain or anything? Well, like I think actually it would, it would raise these questions. Is President Trump putting in a position where he's trying to hide something, that he to keep these conversations private? Uh, and it raises the question of... This is what happens when you have these Senate Intelligence Committees and the Judiciary Committee. They create mm -hmm. this public environment where mm -hmm. Comey is able to, you know, g g talk about memos questions. that we haven't seen for exactly, three weeks, and, and as then, if they're real, right? And then yeah. that becomes the story. So I think right. that there is probably a temptation from the White House to say, "Go ahead and go and, and exert executive privilege," but I just don't foresee it happening. So what's interesting about what you, what you just said, and this was a teachable moment for me, Pete, and that is that the timing that the president might have done that would have been weeks ago. He might have said something like, "I hope he doesn't testify because we haven't seen the memos." Sure. Like that would have been a political move. That would have been interesting. Yeah, we want to see the memos and see what they have to say. Yeah. Sure. I mean, President Trump, what do you call him? A showboater? I think we're going to see showboating. Yeah. Are we wrong guy... about that? He had a Twitter account. No, of course. He's the of FBI director. And well, an Instagram. And he also has proven himself to be a very political animal. And this action that he took with the memorandum is that. And ultimately, I don't think President Trump has anything to win by, by invoking executive privilege. It makes it look like you have something to hide. He doesn't, I believe, in this case. And he says, hey, I just kind of, if I made a comment, it was an offhand comment. Hey, you know, this guy, this guy didn't do anything. You know, hey, it's it's not, I mean, those types of conversations probably happen more than we know. You just don't always have a political animal in the FBI director who documents it, and then when he gets fired, which the president has every right to do, says, I'm going to leak this out for my own benefit. But this is a double-edged sword for Hendrish, because if he documented it and didn't raise it, to intelligence officials as a problem that the president or anybody had interfered in any way with an investigation. That's actually not just untoward, it's illegal. Mm -hmm. You're absolutely right. And so this is why it's going to be challenging for James Comey. If he says, I felt as though the president was trying to influence this or shut down this investigation, then guess what? He didn't do his job. He did not do his job. And I hope that we can all have more faith in the FBI director than to think that if the president is telling him to shut down something, that he doesn't say something about it. Yeah. But we don't have faith in the FBI director. That's the problem. He's such a deeply politicized figure on both sides throughout the election that it's difficult for me to even comprehend something he could say if he does end up testifying that's going to sway people, especially a lot of Trump's hardcore supporters, to think, oh, Eureka, actually, I believe you. <laughs> yeah. You don't completely, like, <laughs> what is this moment that we think is going to happen? So he, the damage he has done are completely self-inflicted wounds, and all of these problems are his own. And your credibility is all you have, especially as the leader of the FBI. So going on the stand, I just don't know what kind of clarity we're even go ultimately, go ultimately going to get. Because as you pointed out, Pete, these memos that he was making, we have reason to believe maybe they were politicized at the time because he knew that, you know, he could possibly be fired. Yeah, interesting. I know I mentioned Twitter. You mentioned Instagram. The point of this is that he was the FBI director at the time, weighing in and out of investigations around a presidential election. It's interesting. President Trump's former campaign manager, Corey Lewandowski, has issued a stark warning to Republicans, align with the president or lose your seats in 2018. Is he right? That's next.
numbered in just a minute. But first to John Scott with what's coming up in the second hour of Happening Now. Hey, Megan, in our next hour, we're awaiting that Rose Garden ceremony from President Trump. He'll be announcing his final decision on the Paris climate deal. We're also learning former FBI Director James Comey will testify before the Senate Intelligence Committee on Thursday, June 8th. And in the other chamber, the House Intel Committee issuing new subpoenas. We've got Fox team coverage ahead on Happening Now. Megan. Thanks so much, John. Thanks. President Trump's former campaign manager, Corey Lewandowski, issuing a stark warning to Republicans. Get in line with the president or risk losing your seats in 2018. Watch him here. President Trump was elected to change the country. And you can get on board that train or you can lose your next election because I can promise you this. The Democrats have a different agenda. They have forgotten about the middle class. They've forgotten about infrastructure. They've forgotten about the people who voted for Donald Trump for change. And if you don't want to provide that change, in 18 months, we're going to have another election. And what that means is if the Democrats take control of the House, the agenda that this president has outlined on the campaign and continues to try and implement will be gone. But moderate Republican Senator Jeff Flake is testing that theory. He's keeping his distance from President Trump. He's speaking frankly about Republican shortcomings in Washington. Now he faces a conservative primary opponent, which he admits has made his reelection more difficult, saying, and I quote, if I wanted an easier path through the primary, then I'd line up more with where the president is. It'll be a tougher path than I could have had, but or would have had, but I think I'll get there. I'm going to go to you, Mercedes. What, I mean, it, how challenging is it, is it going to be for Flake and for others that are running that are not in the Trump camp? Well, look, there's about 25 of these districts that are the swing districts. There's more than those, but those 25 specifically where Hillary Clinton won those districts last year in 2016. Those, uh, those congressional seats in particular, for example, Carlos Curbelo in Florida, Barbara Comstock in Virginia, they run a very different message. They've got to try to find that balance. So guess what? They talk about climate change. They talk about uh, other issues, and they, some of them have been a never Trump camp. So they do distance themselves because what are they thinking? They've got to win a congressional race. With that being said, they also have to show that they can govern. The Republicans have to show that they can get tax reform done, that they're able to negotiate and get something done on, on health care reform, and also the economic message, which is so critical. See, I think that's going to be the challenge, right, Megan? I mean, if, if people are going to the polls and they're saying, well, you know, we put Trump in and we put you all in and you haven't done a darn thing, then it's going to be very challenging or you may not see the turnout that you would have seen in a presidential year. If you don't get repeal and replace done, I would debate by the end of the summer, it is going to be no bueno going into midterm <laughs> elections, hands down. I really like Jeff Flake. I think he's a great senator, but he was, I don't know if he was a never Trumper, but he was certainly highly critical of President Trump at the time. I think it's easy to forget sometimes that there are different factions of the Republican Party, like there are different factions of the Democratic Party. There are people that are more moderate, people that are more centrist, and we make up one big giant party. And I think it's not necessarily just about supporting President Trump so much as not supporting the Democrats. Mm -hmm. But it'll be interesting to see how it ultimately plays out with him. The same woman who tried to primary my dad is primarying him. Hmm. No, there are a lot of factions in the Republican Party, true. But if the Republican Party cannot coalesce around repealing and replacing Obamacare and fundamental tax reform, cutting taxes, then what the heck does the Republican Party stand for? This isn't about the Trump camp. This is about can yes. Republicans govern at all, from, from, from Ted Cruz to, to Jeff Flake. And if they can't find 51 votes, because they're not going to need 60, it's reconciliation, they've got 52 in the caucus, if they can't come together and say the Republican brand is either going to be obstructionist or capable of governing through limited government and personal responsibility and empowering people through freedom, then just disband it because it means nothing. This is their moment. And if Senate Republicans don't realize that, then they're lost. I just got hit by all shards of the mic you just dropped. <laughs> so that question stands, and so does this one in my mind. What were they doing for seven years with regard to Obamacare? I mean, the, the, why would you yeah. want to vote? people back into office if you as Republicans don't have the confidence that they're going to break and actually get something done with regard to something that's imploding, Obamacare, mm -hmm. with regard to tax reform. I agree. Where do you stand on these issues that were supposed to define your your party and the president is not fuzzy but these, on these swing issues. districts it's very clear that they're independent voters in a lot of these cases so these moderate republicans are trying to manage the republican base which is a little more conservative and these independent voters for example that they could swing quickly to the left if they feel that this repeal and replace of obama well, rather is than not managing them why don't they manage to get something done 
Oh, that's that's critical. But in their minds, the Democrats are selling this idea of 23 fight million Americans. Fight back. Fight back. Fight back. That's There's right. also factions, though, I'm more interested, the most interested to see how it goes with repeal in place with members of the Freedom Caucus, people that I would I would define as libertarians more than Republicans. But and if they ultimately, but if they try and ultimately hijack this with their own ideological win versus for the good of the party. Yeah. Uh, Democrats have already said, some of them, those who are more moderate, that you may be able to scoop some of them up just on the basis of repair rather than repeal. That would be interesting if you got more of them than the Freedom Caucus. We don't know how it's going to roll, but we are going to come right back. So stay close.